Welcome to our panel session today on the important role nonprofits play in helping communities impacted by natural disaster. I'm Steve Kraut, Director of Policy and Resilience Programs at the Smart Cities Council. I have been fortunate to serve as project manager for the groundbreaking Readiness for Resilience Program that serves to help communities impacted by natural disaster build a resilience roadmap forward so that they are better prepared for, better able to respond to, and better able to recover from future storms. This is a multi-stakeholder process, including government, industry, academia, and the nonprofit community. We thought it would be particularly important for city and community leaders attending this conference to hear from a couple nonprofit organizations that have answered the call to provide essential services and assistance during crisis situations, often with very little limited resources, but unyielding commitment. I am so pleased to have Jennifer Gray Thompson of Rebuild North Bay and Emily Baronet from Visionality join our panel today. But first and foremost, we are thrilled to receive a keynote presentation from Linda Mastandria, who serves as director of the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination at FEMA. Linda leads the effort to ensure that the needs of individuals with disabilities are included in all aspects of natural disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. Linda is a nationally recognized expert on inclusive emergency management practices, a multi-gold medal and Hall of Fame Paralympic champion, and an author of a book on sports and the physically challenged. We are so grateful to have Linda share her vast experience and knowledge on how we can all work together to protect and serve individuals with disability in times of natural disaster. Linda, we look forward to your presentation. Hello, and thank you Smart Cities Council for this opportunity to present today. On behalf of the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA, I want to welcome all the attendees and stakeholders that make up Smart Cities Week 2020. Whether the goal is to make a city smarter and more efficient, or to enhance the resiliency of critical infrastructure in communities impacted by natural disasters, inclusion and access for all are such an important part of the entire process from planning through deployment. In fact, representing and helping individuals with disabilities is my core mission as director of the FEMA Office of Disability Integration and Coordination. Preparing, responding, and recovering from disaster is a shared responsibility and requires the federal government to work with its state, local, tribal, and territorial partners to build preparedness and resilience across the nation's communities. Regardless of the challenges we confront, FEMA remains committed to our mission of helping people before, during, and after disasters. And the framework by which we accomplish this mission remains unchanged. Responses are most effective when locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. The unprecedented scope of disasters over the past few years have presented an enormous challenge for all levels of government, civil society, and the private sector. Disaster events, including the pandemic, have demonstrated that building a culture of preparedness and developing resilient communities ahead of an emergency reduces the loss of life, property, and economic disruption. Engagement between people with disabilities and community leaders is vital because planning with people with disabilities makes for more resilient cities and communities. Engaging long before disasters happen helps everyone. That's going to help communities prepare to serve people with disabilities in their communities, as well as continuing to encourage personal preparedness. And the perfect opportunity to engage is coming up soon. FEMA publishes a comprehensive preparedness guide, which establishes a uniform planning process for communities developing or revising their emergency operations plans. This document provides a national process for whole community planning and is being updated to further emphasize whole community engagement, including considerations for people with disabilities into all aspects of the planning process. This revised guide will go out for national engagement at the end of 2020. 
And so it's really important to know that all of us can work together to ensure that people with disabilities have equitable access to programs and services in the communities where they live and work. And that's the direction that FEMA is heading in. FEMA is committed to creating accessible, livable, and sustainable communities. Accessibility for people with disabilities is an integral part in planning for emergencies, response, and recovery, and rebuilding for resiliency. In fact, a large portion of what FEMA does is restore public infrastructure after disasters. Cities, towns, and neighborhoods have to be built to be inclusive and accessible and to consider the needs of people with disabilities living and visiting there. Through our public assistance program funding, FEMA has a significant role to play in rebuilding communities after disaster, whether it's a hurricane, a flood, a fire, or even a tornado. And as you see public infrastructure and buildings being rebuilt, the federal dollars injected into each area can help communities ensure that rebuilding is done in an accessible way in line with the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and other relevant laws. The ADA requires that any public facility be accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. FEMA provides public assistance funding for costs related to these federal ADA accessibility requirements. Over the course of this generation alone, we've seen some huge improvements. For example, most mass transit around the nation has become accessible and people with disabilities now are usually able to evacuate alongside people without disabilities on buses and trains in the event of emergency or disaster. And for people with disabilities who still can't use fixed route buses or mainline transportation, most major cities usually have paratransit availability, which means door to door pickup and transport in those emergency situations. We've also seen advancements in access to public spaces such as parks and recreation facilities, places of public accommodation like movie theaters and restaurants, and in general, improvements in access to participation in civic life. These are encouraging signs of progress, but we recognize there's still a lot of work to be done. After a catastrophic event, we have the opportunity to rebuild better, more accessible, more sustainable and more resilient communities and cities where people with disabilities are able to live side by side with their neighbors and friends and more fully engage in recreation, participate in civic life, go to restaurants and beaches and all of those things right alongside their neighbors. And as important as improvements to the built environment are, we can't overlook the importance of technology in our everyday lives as well. There are significant advancements in assistive and communications technologies, allowing people with all types of disabilities to engage, interact, and communicate with their families, their friends, and their colleagues. So let's talk a little bit more about our work in this area. FEMA is working internally and externally with other federal agencies to promote the use of American Sign Language and captioning into virtual platforms that we've been using during the COVID-19 global pandemic. This pandemic has changed how we work and how we live. Most of us are working from our homes and we've become increasingly dependent on access to technology to do our jobs. Virtual platforms, including those used for meetings and things like telehealth, allow us to have more effective communication access to serve us now and that will allow us to continue to have communication access in the future. FEMA also uses social media to provide accessible messaging. This includes the production and distribution of multimedia messages that use an American Sign Language interpreter, captioning, voiceover, and audio description. And this enables us to reach the widest possible audience, including people with all types of disabilities. Another example of accessible communication is the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS. This is FEMA's national system for local alerts. It provides authenticated emergency and life-saving information to the public through mobile phones using wireless emergency alerts and to radio and television via the emergency alert. IPAWS uses what's known as Common Alerting Protocol or CAP, which lets alerts sent on the system transport rich multimedia attachments and links. 
using CAP enables private industry partners to develop both content and devices that can be used by individuals with disabilities to receive important emergency alerts and information. But no matter how advanced our technology or how well built our buildings, we will accomplish much more if we can come together and work together. Engaging community members, including people with disabilities, stakeholders and partners in meeting the needs of people with disabilities is a FEMA priority before, during, and after disasters. FEMA uses internal and external resources to help us quantify the needs of people with disabilities during preparedness, response, and recovery. These resources allow us to make data-driven decisions and work with, within communities with leaders like all of you to maximize our outreach and outcomes for people with disabilities. And we know nonprofits and non-governmental organizations are some of our most important community partners in preparedness, response, and recovery. And FEMA stands ready to help make connections and work together to help you use resources in the most effective way possible while ensuring our partners never stand alone. FEMA is constantly adapting to new conditions and incorporating new technologies and new partnerships to accomplish our mission of helping people before, during, and after disasters. We welcome opportunities to coordinate with community leaders and planners as we work together to protect lives. Before I close, I wanna say thank you for your work in all of these areas and for including the needs of people with disabilities in your planning. I look forward to hearing from many of you that are here today at Smart Cities Week 2020 to continue the conversations on how we can work together to build accessible, sustainable, and resilient communities. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your most important and inspiring keynote message. And next, we will hear from Jennifer Gray Thompson of Rebuild North Bay and Emily Baronet from Visionality. Jennifer. Please lead us off. Hi, Stephen. Uh, this is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am here to speak on behalf of Rebuild North Bay Foundation. I am the executive director. Uh, Rebuild North Bay was founded in the midst of our terrible wildfires of October of 2017. And the scope and scale of our disaster was so big that the leaders in our community knew that it was going to take actually a very concentrated, um, collaborative and coordinated approach to overcome it. Prior to 2017, we hadn't really seen wildfires that it behaved exactly like we see several times a year now through this extended fire season. We had sort of a clue in 2015 with the Valley Fire in Lake County, what might be coming down the pipe, but no one, especially not even fire experts or Cal Fire had ever experienced these sort of mega fires that we've ended up having yearly since then. On the evening of October 8th, our lives in Sonoma, Napa, Lake and Mendocino counties were entirely different um, than they would become in the days. Within 24 hours, our lives would change. Our fire moved, um, it moved 20 miles in five hours, and it took out 6,000 structures in the first night alone. And by the time that our fire was extinguished 23 days later, there were over 9,000 structures. Now, the scope and scale is one thing and the speed is another thing, but one of the things that we noticed is that these fires don't care about what's called the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. They moved right over a freeway. This fire literally took the overpass to get around a corner and through a lot and into what you've probably seen on the news as Coffee Park. This fire was a whole different animal. And at the time we thought, oh, well, this will be the only one. And so we all banded together in a very um, coordinated way and believed that we would be the penultimate fire for all of the ages to come. 
Now, the genius about Rebuild North Bay Foundation is that it brings together the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. If you look at our board, you'll see that our founder, Darius Anderson, was very mindful in how he chose the leadership. We have healthcare, we have social equity, we have tribal leader at the table, we have a, um, an, an auto dealer who's a major business, a major employer in the area. We have agribusiness, we have agritourism, we have hospitality. We have a multitude of, um, of sectors and types of businesses who are actually sitting at the table because they wanted to do more than write a check. They were happy to write a check, but they actually wanted to loan their talents. With our founder, Darius Anderson, his particular talent is building relationships. And by trade, he is a developer and a lobbyist and um, is also a managing owner of the media here at, um, in Sonoma County. Now, one of the questions that Stephen asked me to um, address was, was there any sort of uh, barriers or constraint moment? And in fact, when I heard about Rebuild North Bay, I was working for the County of Sonoma at the time. And it didn't, um, I couldn't figure out what they were doing. I didn't know what they were doing. And then I heard Darius speak about it one day and his, what he was saying was, we're going to help these uh, fire survivors in this community get back to where we were before, but we want to build back better. And this organization is going to be solely devoted to that cause. That's what we're going to do. And he didn't know what it would look like. He knew that we would do advocacy and he knew that we would go to DC and that we would make sure that this area got the actual public funds and um, that, that was deserved. He made, he, he knew that our presence was needed um, to support our public sector and work in concert with them, but he didn't really know what the rest of it was gonna look like. We're a 501c3. So we actually have to keep our um, lobbying down to below 20%, and that's a perceived impact as well. So we very successfully kept those numbers between um, 2% and 5%, and we've just begun our fourth fiscal year of um, operations. So for those of you who are like, would this work for my place? Oh no, you can't do this sort of thing. You actually can, because there's plenty of work to do that has nothing to do with advocacy, but do not um, believe, but do not mis mistake yourself. Advocacy is um, part of the secret sauce of Rebuild North Bay and why it is that three years post-disaster, Sonoma County is 75% rebuilt, and that is almost unheard of. It also has to do with the cost of our land is very um, valuable, So, and we're aware of that. It can be replicated though. And on November um, 8th, 2018, as we broke ground on one of our projects, because we fill these gaps, um, we, had, we were uh, broke ground on the coffee park walls. We actually funded that and then helped project manage and helped the community driven process. And we looked up into the hills and we saw a big plume of smoke. And that was actually the Butte uh, fire in Paradise, the campfire. And there's something about going through a really awful traumatizing experience as a community that when you see other people go through it, it is, um, it's extra painful. And we never wanted another community to have to begin at the beginning of how do you, rec how do you recover from this massive wildfire that reduces your entire town or large portions of it to three to four inches of oily ash. And I knew from personal experience working inside of the county how traumatized the public sector actually was. Many had lost their homes. And it was, um, they, it was, it was a challenge to get them to actually um, open up enough to be vulnerable enough because people were already screaming at them all the time to also be able to collaborate in a way that was really uh, functional in the best interest of the community. But, I really had to hand it to our public sector leaders, like enough of them really dove in that we were able to break that barrier that you actually see often um, post-disaster. So when um, paradise happened, the last thing that we wanted was for them to be in a position where they would be um, Googling as we were, how to recover from a disaster, because that is a, a ridiculous place for any, anybody to be in especially when you're traumatized and you are in pain. So I got into my car and uh, made a couple of calls and a friend of a friend was interested in helping and I had never met him before. And I had an appointment with the mayor of um, Paradise, uh, Mayor Jones, and then also with the town manager, Lauren Gill. Now it was very kind of them to take an appointment from me 
um, especially as, as I am unknown, but one of the nice things about our board is that the quality of the leadership that we're bringing to the table is such that more people are willing to listen. And so if you're thinking of doing something like this to build your own resiliency or respond to a disaster, um, I highly recommend that you make it multi-sector, multi, like a 360 view of what your community will need so that you're actually hearing what they need. And it's not just a vanity project because that was really important to Darius that we did not make this a vanity project, that this was something that was actually effective. So as I sat there um, and, it, and Paradise was still burning and, there, and the contemporary town hall was in downtown Chico and I brought into the meeting with us uh, Charles Brooks and Charles had lost his home in Paradise. He has a wonderful wife, Jen, and their two boys, young family and was really dedicated and remains dedicated to ensuring that Paradise comes back. So he comes in and he sits in the meeting and um, both Joe, both uh, the mayor and the town manager look at me like really tired. Like, what do you want from me? Because they know that three types of people are gonna show up post-disaster. Those who wanna sell you something, those who want to defraud you, and those who want to help. And figuring out like who is who and where is what is exhausting. And the first thing that they needed to hear from me was that I wasn't there to sell them anything. I wasn't there to charge them anything. We were just there like a community to community. That's all I was trying to say. Like we will pay our lessons forward. Why begin at the beginning? What are your problems? Like here is what our organization does is, is full-time disaster all the time. And Charles was sitting over here and he likes to say that that day I, um, recruited him by telling them that he would open up his own version of Rebuild North Bay Foundation, but it would be Rebuild Paradise. And I don't remember it like that, but I could have done that. That's true. He said he wanted to help. And I was like, well, I, I, I mean, there's this thing that um, I think is a good idea, might help your community. Um, and his whole life changed that week. Not only did he lose his home, but he went from being a very um, um, excellent uh, reusable grocery bag salesman. And I like to tell that story because I want people to understand that you are the Calvary and that emerging leadership should be embraced all the time. You don't need a master's in a public administration, which I happen to have, but you don't need any of that in order to have a successful community-based post-disaster organization. You need someone like Charles. You need people who love and care about it. And so from that day on, um, I started um, picking up the phone and Charles and I would talk several times a week and he changed his whole life. And he created Rebuild Paradise Foundation. And to be clear, they are their own foundation. He has raised their own money and they have their own programs that are really innovative and really interesting. So the interesting thing in the puzzle of disaster work is you know what works for one community isn't going to exactly be work for another community but that shouldn't stop any of us from actually saying well you know here's a version of what we did we're happy to actually assist you if you would like to adapt this for what would work for your community and paradise is a mountain town and most of paradise was destroyed and it was not um, economically diverse, which is one way of saying that the people who lived in, uh, in Paradise were not necessarily wealthy, which is different from Sonoma. We have a lot more um, extremes in our wealth and in our poverty right here. Still, the model itself of how to build an organization that solely is dedicated to the long-term recovery is valuable for any, and here's why. What happens in a disaster is that everyone sees it and their empathy and their compassion is, um, is, it comes through and they want to bring you things. Unfortunately, one of the things they want to bring you is their clothes. And we need to stop that. We need to stop sending our clothes unless they are specifically asked for um, to disaster communities. We are creating repeatedly secondary disasters of having to do um, management of those donations that were not asked for and, and to understand like, that our need to actually give has to take second place to what the disaster affected community needs to receive. I think that's a really important thing to note. We always ask, what do you need and how can we help? And that is how we do all of our grant making. That is how we do our outreach. We're, we're just like, here we are. 
and we can help, but we're also gonna try not to be intrusive in that process. What Charles did is that he went out and he started talking to all of his community and figuring out what would work in his community. And I do think that a lot of the programs that he um, instituted in Paradise, that they have saved the county and the city um, several hundred thousand dollars using uh, maps, doing public right-of-way mapping, um, drones, missing middle grants. One thing that all communities need to do immediately post-disaster is reduce their cost of rebuilding through permit fees. Side note, because I know a lot of you at Smart Cities, uh, are, you also run cities. So um, over the course of the next year, I did mentor Charles um, towards his own total independence. And now I would consider him a mentor to me and to other newly fire affected communities. The Woolsey fire actually broke out the same day as the Camp Fire down in Malibu. And again, I went down there and I met with this startup nonprofit called the Malibu Foundation. And I just answered questions. And I like to always review the damage because I don't like to weigh in on something that I haven't seen. And then over the course of the next year, I would pick up their phone calls too. Um, and just, just it's a little questions or how do you know d debris removal? How do you, you know, like how do you make sure they're not over scraping? What are your rights about that? Oh, uh, po United Policy Holders. They're the first people who will be on the ground because they're going to help with all of the insurance issues. Our biggest and best partner has been actually Fannie Mae. And I was very surprised uh, three years ago, almost three years ago when I took this job and um, I got a call from Fannie Mae and they were like, you know, we would like to come and take a tour. And I thought, I don't get it, but okay, all right. You know, you wanna see it, you're a big company. Sure, I'll show it to you. Maybe it'll help our community in some way. And that was the best sure I've ever done because uh, we spent the day touring with them and then we met with various community leaders. And what we learned is that they have an entire program dedicated to post-disaster help and relief for renters and homeowners. And they can't, and they are game changers. So they wrote, they underwrote the first five mortgages in paradise to get people to actually other lenders to get in the game. You know, sometimes you have to be the first um, organization or person to invest in a great idea for other people to then come along. And in our experience, and we've been all over the country now, um, talking about rebuild, um, it's oftentimes with Fannie Mae in the room and oftentimes not with Fannie Mae in the room, but I really appreciate that they recognize that we are a different sort of organization. We are not social equity. We are long-term um, we are, for the most part, not sexy. We have rebuilt walls because that's what the community asked for. We have funded things like if you have land and you have animals and you want to, or say you have land but no animals or animals but no land and you would like to do a match, we have funded a website that does um, fuel mitigation through essentially like, it's really like, you know, um, a dating app for um, resiliency. We fund research studies. We have a scholar in residence about communication failures and disaster, but what we're, not, we're not trying to call people out. We're actually trying to call them in. What we do is we try to make something um, intensely human and valuable um, emerge from what is a viscerally um, terrifying experience, which is to burn down. Hello, friends. My name is Emily Barony. I'm a social entrepreneur who builds businesses that make the world a better place. Today, I'm gonna to share with you my accidental journey into starting a tech company and why I think that together, you and me, we get to make the world a better place. It's 2017 and I'm running my company, Visionality. We help nonprofits professionalize and grow. And I'm just skipping around my life. Things are pretty good. And then I get a call in the middle of the night and my friend says, Emily, there's a fire. My house is going to burn down. Please come and get me. I cannot get my car out of the gate. I remember driving up the hill and watching the fire burn down the hill and there are embers flying everywhere and I can't breathe from the smoke. That was the first night of the Thomas fire. And the next morning I knew I needed to help. And I'm horrified to admit this and I promise I've learned my lesson. But that morning I bought water that nobody needed, like a lot of water. And I waited in a long line to donate the water that nobody needed. 
And then when I got to the front of that long line with my water that nobody needed, I got turned away because nobody needed my water. Now, this is what I do for a living. I help nonprofits professionalize and grow. I coach organizations on how to maximize their volunteers. And when I was turned away, the message I heard was, we don't need help. Now, of course, that's not true. Our community needed help. We just didn't need that specific kind of help that I offered. And I knew that we could do better. And so I built something that day. And what I built was awful. It was an unprotected Google Sheet with different tabs for the different categories of help. Talk about a security nightmare. And yet, within 24 hours, we had hundreds of offers of help. Free food, housing, animal help, volunteers, supplies. And that's when I had my first realization. During disasters, everybody wants to help, but nobody knows how. Turn around, the flash flood's right there. The flash flood's right there. Get out of here, go. Oh my God, mom. Close the door. It was a million miles an hour in slow motion. If that makes sense, um, I clicked into survival gear, <laughs> survival mode. Out. Wake that up. Every second, it's just roaring and banging against the house and the most vicious, violent sounds you've ever heard. This was somebody's driveway. There are three cars destroyed, buried inside that rubble. And looking at this house, it's difficult to believe that anyone on this street survived. But many did, and their stories are remarkable. People walk their dogs through here. There's trails. My kids have grown up riding their bikes. And two young boys were swept out of their home along with their mother in the middle of the night. And their dog is uh, gone and they're lucky to be fine. I mean, it's just like a war zone here. There's homes that are just missing. And I walked down the street and I see balls and toys and bicycles and shoes and socks and n knives and hammers. And it's like people's lives are just washed to the ocean. The Montecito debris flow was unexpected and unimaginable. And it happened so quick. It felt like it was just overnight after the Thomas fire. The hillside came down, 65 homes disappeared in the middle of the night, 23 people died. I saw boulders the size of fire trucks in neighborhood streets and cars were swept miles down the hill into the ocean and nobody knew what to do. A few days after the debris flow, I got a call from one of our state elected officials. The 101 freeway was closed and in order to move north or south, um, each direction it was either a five hour drive or a two hour boat ride. This elected official said that their primary concern was moving critical personnel over the slide. And so we put a call out to our community and we got free pilots and we got free planes and we were flying people. We flew surgery follow-up appointments. We flew blood to replace critically low supplies up north. We flew a team of neonatal nurses who said, Emily, we need to get up to Cottage Hospital. Our babies need us. We flew a heart surgeon named John who was driving five hours each direction to do heart surgery. And we flew Joanne who's a breast cancer patient who needed chemo five days a week. And we flew Ellie, who was an eight-year-old girl with brain cancer who couldn't miss her appointment with CHLA. All told, the Montecito airlift had 64 pilots who flew 117 passengers, 
We flew as far north as Palo Alto and as far south as San Diego and just about everywhere in between. We used a tech system and our pilots claimed missions within two minutes. And that's when I had my second realization. Here's the thing, Cottage Hospital couldn't do this. They would have needed to charter a jet and they just couldn't. Our secret sauce is that we professionalize the grassroots response. We are nimble. We have a higher risk tolerance than our larger partners. We mobilize the community to help themselves. So now here we are, it's three years and six disasters later, and we've gotten to do some really cool things. We got masks donated and delivered to our farm workers during the Thomas fire. We got hay donated to evacuated horses. We got housing for hundreds of people, getting them out of the shelters and into a temporary space. We got chocolates donated for firefighters. We set up a kid's sports camp during the Woolsey fire while the schools were closed for two weeks. We got a storefront donated at the Oaks Mall where fire survivors could shop for free and recover with dig dignity. We even got Wi-Fi to a shelter in Camarillo when internet was down countywide during the Woolsey fire. Check it out. Do you see that time? It is 2.26 a.m. I just saw Emily post that they needed oil and for someone to go do it. And so I'm awake, I just got home and said, oh crap, I guess I'm it. So guess who's gonna go search for oil at 2.26 in the morning to take it up to the hills of Camarillo? That would be me. If we got Stephanie to deliver oil to a random hillside to make our generator work, to bring internet to the evacuation center, and if we can create a volunteer airline, then we can do anything. And that's when I had my third realization. What we built locally needs to exist globally. We in disaster recovery need to stop reinventing the wheel. We need to harness the power of individuals and we need to empower communities to help themselves because they can. And so we're building it. It's an app called Connected where strangers become neighbors through disaster recovery. Connected is four things. It's a tech platform. It's a rapid deployment plan, which is essentially the deployment to-do list. It is a team of paid experienced professionals and it is partnerships with people like you. We believe that everyone has a place in the recovery and that we together, me and you, we get to change the world. So let me show you how the app works. Clark lost his ranch in the fire and he creates a profile on Connected and creates a mission. His horse Cinnamon needs a place to stay. Diana sees the mission, everyone swipes right and they are connected. They use in-app messaging to arrange everything. Diana shares pictures to Facebook, encouraging her friends to get involved. It's gamified and this is Diana's 10th mission, so she's earned a badge. Connected as a company, connects help with need. We solve big, small, and unique problems like the airlift. We find ways to say yes to every offer of help, like we did in the Woolsey fire. That sports facility volunteered to be an evacuation shelter. And of course, shelter plans are made far in advance. You can't just spontaneously volunteer to be an evacuation shelter. And so we turned their offer into a kid's camp while schools were closed for two weeks. We're also community education, like pre-disaster preparedness missions, because prepared communities are resilient communities. We like to say that everyone has a place in the recovery. Traditionally, two resources are left on the table during disasters, the community and the power of technology. I want you to imagine if everyone had the connected app in their pocket. I'm gonna leave you with my really big vision. Gone are the days when you had to donate thousands of dollars or take a year off to volunteer. Every day in every community, someone needs help. And every day in every community, someone wants to give help. They just don't know how. Connected turns strangers into neighbors. 
We connect help with need in large, small, and amazing ways. We are the future of humanitarianism. So I hope you'll join me because together we get to change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Emily, for your presentations and your commitment to the needs of your local communities. Incredible stories. Thank you for sharing. And now I'd like to ask you a few short questions. I wanted to ask you both um, from your perspective, what can nonprofits or NGOs actually do better than government? A lot of uh, things. <laughs> please, share. Well, so um, I shared in my presentation, you know, the Montecito airlift that we did. Uh, we solved a problem that the government couldn't solve and that our large corporations couldn't solve. Our primary customer, the primary beneficiary of our airlift was Cottage Hospital because we flew, they're a big cancer center and we flew cancer patients and we flew neonatal nurses up to them. And if they were to approach this challenge, they would have had to charter a jet, which they couldn't do for financial reasons. And so it's, you know, it's been really fun to explore what are the pieces of response and recovery that really need to be under the government purview and it is what they do and they're good at it and they're effective at it. And there's a whole bunch of stuff around that that NGOs and citizens are really, really good at. And, and there can, I've, I've felt a big hesitancy in opening the doors to allow outside help and it needs to be really managed and and controlled and you know you need someone in charge but what has been really uplifting and fun is there is someone who does the exact thing that you do in your community you just have to be specific about your request so our pilots for the airlift could have been sorting through boxes at at a, at a shelter and that's a very important piece of the job. And when we gave them an opportunity to do something that I can't do, uh, that most people in our community can't do, they stepped up to that challenge. And so our experience is as long as you are specific in your asks of the community, that proper person will self screen and step up and volunteer in a way that's actually quite professional. No, so I agree. Really I think what it brings up though is that um, in the short term, everyone has, everyone stands up and the, the, there are a group of social equity in particular um, NGOs that have to be supported through those donations because a disaster can affect everyone the same when it happens, but the equity piece of it coming out of it is entirely different. Um, now we serve farm worker to two cardiologists because we believe that we need everybody in between and all talents. We are not a social equity organization, but we do equity when we see it. You know, if you if we have COVID, we know that you're serving um, during COVID. We knew like who was serving Latino facing organizations that they would need Zoom grants, and we can be so fast because we are singularly devoted to coordination, collaboration, and advocacy in a disaster post-disaster um, area. And so, and the other thing that we believe is that every area that experiences a disaster can stand up their own organization for long-term recovery that does coordination, collaboration, and advocacy. It doesn't require a special master's degree. It requires that you love your community. And then it requires, I do think it's important for communities like ours that we pay it forward. And that's what we do. So that's why I'm going to like Talent and Medford. That's where I'm going there next week. I'm going for the, uh, to Santa Cruz for the CZU Lightning Fire and then up into Northern Oregon. It's only to say, hey, we're here. We've, we've done this before, but every community, uh, unless you reach out, they will have to begin at the beginning. And that is no way to do disaster. And so my number one thing is, um, yes, NGOs can do things um, that, that, that the private sector can't do. Like, we all have a role to play. We all have to be at the table. We all have to help each other figure out how to get to that table and how to stay in this lane um, to do what you do best. And I think that Emily and I are speaking in exactly the same ways. Well, and, and 
recovery does need to come from the community. It needs to be community driven and community led. And tell me if you had the same experience, but our community really turned inward during our disaster. And, you know, it's been years since the Thomas fire and we have not changed. We do not trust outsiders. We, we don't like them. Uh, you know, we, it really was, you know, during our recovery, well, who are you and where did you come from? And who, oh, who that's just smart though, because three types of people are going to show up post disaster. They either want to sell you something, defraud you or help you. And figuring Absolutely. that out is exhausting, which is why we, as we start, we lead with that. We're like, we're not here to sell you anything. We are a 501c3. Here we've helped Paradise for the first year. They have a Rebuild Paradise Foundation. You can call them and talk to them. Also now they are part of the mentorship program. You can call Malibu and Woolsey Fire the Malibu Foundation and they'll tell you too. Like, because when we show up, we're very um, uh, sort of reserved in, in, so that we aren't trying to take over the process. And, I, and all I say is, so what do you need? How can we help? Yes. That's it. Um, and then you hold back and uh, because trust is critical, but we can, once they figure out what we do, then you see like their whole um, countenance change because all of a sudden they're like, oh, it's like somebody informing you that you have a big sister when you really needed one, you're 13. Yep. And, you know, puberty is going very wrong. And, you, and then you're like, well, you know, I'll be here for you. You can pick up the phone. I'm never going to charge you anything, which is why work like this has to be funded. It's got to be uh, very long term. Like recovery is seven to 30 years to never. And in Sonoma County, we are 75% rebuilt. We are three years post-disaster. And that is because of the community and the ecosystem of care. It is not because of any one organization. It is public or private or nonprofit. Well, and I want to build on that that funding piece a little bit. Um, and I mentioned like those those magical two weeks post disaster when the national or international money comes in, and disaster funding is quite reactionary instead of proactive, and and that's a big problem. And and part of um, effective recovery is having those systems in place, having the re relationships built, um, and having those best, best practices documented. And none of that can happen when you're in the middle of a disaster. It can only happen before. And but it, but it's also really hard to get proactive preparatory funding. And so talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, yeah. You know, Jennifer, I know your organization has done some federal advocacy uh, in D.C. I've had a long history of um, working in the policy sectors uh, here in, in D.C. And one of the most encouraging things we have coming out of Washington is that FEMA has now issued their new uh, BRIC program, uh, Building Resilient Communities and Infrastructure, that is now going to provide significantly more funding than it has in the past for these pre-mitigation activities, right? Training, um, working with local communities uh, to start planning, developing strategies um, well before the next storm. Uh, and so there is hope from the federal side. Um, and I uh, encourage everybody listening in to take a look at the BRIC program. We're actually having another panel on this session with FEMA representatives um, to discuss that, that program. And, and hopefully that will be available for the nonprofits like we have here on, on this call uh, or on this panel. Um, and of course, there is um, you know, funding uh, that can come from the corporate side, from the foundation side as well. And you just simply can't have enough. I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, we all know funding and resources are scarce. How do you manage as nonprofit um, to do the work you've done? And then when you're dealing yeah. with potentially success, uh, successive uh, disasters, how are you going to approach that in the future? I can definitely pick up on that. So we were really uh, f fortunate, if, if you want to call it, uh, because nobody had seen a mega fire. And then Ventura came right on the heels of us when they were like, oh, we can do this bigger, not more destructive, but certainly bigger, the Thomas fire. Um, 
So our initial funding was $2 million in seed funding from PG&E because our uh, person who, our founder, Darius Anderson, had a pre-existing relationship with them. So he, they were like, they, they, were, they were not found at fault yet, but certainly they were reeling from the, uh, the grief and what would become actually their ultimate uh, culpability in our fires. And so they gave us $2 million without of seed money because they believed in his idea. Um, and they did not put constraints on it. They just said that be responsible with it, help people rebuild. And they have never interfered in any of our agendas or in any of our work. Although it did create this um, narrative for some people that were like shadow organizations for pg e which is, it's, it's not, it's just not true. There's, but anyway, whatever, who cares? I mean, we're doing the work. So, um, and then, we, so we were able to start there and we kept our expenses really low. We knew we'd be long-term. So in the first year, what I did is that um, I was approached about two projects for the rebuilders, one to rebuild the coffee park wall. Coffee park lost 1,400 homes. And turns out they had this shared wall that they were all going to have to individually pay for, which in a working class community is incredibly hard and would have put a financial burden on people already traumatized. So I got a call from Ash Britt, debris removal, and they were like, we always put money back in the community. We'll give you half a million dollars. What will you do with it? And I'm like, oh, I'll rebuild the wall and I won't take an admin fee. Every dollar will go back to that community. And, and then I called the community leader and I said, is this what you want? Because I will not do stuff that they don't want. And they were like, yes, this is what we want. And they led the process. They got the design. They did all that. We just managed the money and help project management, but that's it. Same thing with a mile of common fencing um, that I like to travel with a video I made about it because I like to watch FEMA officials like get weepy over the building of a fence. So I'm very proud of that. Um, that was a half a million dollars though. Like those are big projects. Um, but people don't donate to our organizations like ours normally because it's not that, that you're like, oh, you've been in this disaster realm for three years post disaster. You've had two successive mega fires since then. Uh, it just doesn't. It just doesn't resonate in the same way. Like I'm on the board of a Latino resource organization. Just doesn't. And people love donating to that, but not necessarily to this. So we've been very mindful. Everything I want to do, I raise the money for. I, I go. It took me 21 funders to do that fence. Um, it, right, right now, the RV tour that we're doing to help other communities. I raised twenty-five thousand dollars to do that from a corporate. Um, from a corporation, the nice thing about corporate money is it should be tied to what you're doing and to outcomes and should be accountable, but it is faster. And we are, a, a, we're a quick organization. We're able to pivot, meet the need. Those fires are still burning in some cases, but I have the funding now to get in my car, get in that RV, I don't know, and go up there and actually help them right now. But you have to be scrappy and you have to be able to explain why it matters. Easy. And I want to talk for a minute about money. And you, you mentioned not taking a fee. And that is the really the theme in, in disaster. The terrible theme for the record. Well, well and <laughs> I, I want to unpack that a little bit yeah. because it, it feels really good to the public to yeah. say 100% of your money goes to helping the people with, but it completely forgets the fact that it takes money to run a company and disaster organizations are companies and the product that they manufacture and sell is recovery. And so it takes money to pay the bookkeeper to write the checks or it takes money to pay you and I to organize all the volunteers. And so I know that no admin fee feels really good, but it is actually catastrophic to the organizations who are doing it. And so what I've seen be really successful is you take those community donations and you say, we're not going to charge a fee on this. And then you find a corporate partner to cover your admin fees. And so I think we have a real opportunity to educate our community about the real work that it takes. We, um, in the wake of the borderline mass shooting in our community, um, we 
our community foundation processed literal millions of dollars uh, in donations in days, and it was costing them tens of thousands of dollars to process those donations, but it just has to come from somewhere. They usually take a pretty significant up to 27% admin fee that goes through community foundation. So community foundation can be the very best choice, but people have to know that they do value administration. This takes talent to do this job. My, I cost money, but we were only able to do the coffee park walls like that because pg e essentially has paid for my um, admin for a period of five years. That's our five-year plan. So that's why I protect those funds is we, we do, do donate some of them. We've donated $1.6 million um, and we put in over 15,000 hours of staff time. And I have a master's degree and I have worked, you know, 80, 100 hour weeks constantly. Um, but to think that we could, that we should be asking people to essentially do this work for free is not only not sustainable, it's not even a good idea because think about the person like, that would do it for $25,000 a year. You're not going to get your top talent. That's just the deal. If you want talent in this area, you have to fund the talent. Well, and com community disaster recovery relies on unpaid, untrained volunteers, which is why I believe our large NGO and government partners don't want to involve the community. Uh, and so when you add funding, appropriate funding, you can get true talented professionals and it completely changes the game in your community recovery. You can. These are some really interesting points and you know when you look at today's environment I think you can argue that uh, resilience really is the issue of our times. You know whether it's our current pandemic with COVID, whether it's the wildfires in California and other parts of the west, uh, the hurricanes uh, along the Gulf and parts of the Atlantic, uh, they're happening uh, in greater numbers and at greater intensity. Uh, and so we really do need to be committing the resources uh, necessary for the expertise. This is not a one-off job anymore, uh, as you both have stated. Um, these efforts take years of recovery, of planning, of pre-mitigation. And so that's a very important point. And so not only being able to pay the qualified um, experts and, 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 and uh, participants, um, but also on a long-term basis uh, is so important. Stephen, can I add to that? One of the things that I would, I would even though you, you say this is working against our own interest, I would like to say that in our experience in DC, we get a very positive reception from the agencies. FCC, USDA, HUD, and FEMA, because they like that we show up regional, we are four counties. They like that we are a nonprofit foundation, that we're coordinating it, and that we are sitting at the table with um, public sector leaders, uh, supervisors, uh, county and city staff. And what we do is that we spend one day meeting with the agencies. We also try to get feedback on how this process could actually be better, especially because FEMA is really set up for wind and rain events, not wildfire in the same way. And, um, and we want to partner with them. Like, and, they, and this is like, they feel like they're getting a lot of bang for their buck in our meetings. And then we go and we meet with all the lawmakers the next day. And we don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, because if fire cared, maybe we'd care, but we just don't care. Like, are you showing up for our community? Are you making sure that we get the public dollars that we need? Because it takes years for most of those dollars to come and then to come through the state as well. So I highly recommend that the public sector be completely open to that sort of multi-sector, we're all in this together. We are here to support our public sector as they were put there to represent the public. So what it is, that, what do you need? And then please ask for it. Well, I totally agree. And, and both of you have mentioned that um, repetitively that we need to have all the stakeholders at the table. and and. I know all three of our organizations uh, involve that um, and will continue to do so. Uh, one final question, um, do you feel that there is enough attention given to these grassroots um, causes, you know, uh, from all other aspects, whether it be the federal government, state government, um, is there a recognition that 
the work needs to be done at the local level. Emily, you want to go first? And I'll, fit, I'll go second. I think there are two parts to your question. Um, there is recognition that the work needs to start local, and that really is like the structure of disaster recovery. It goes local out, and, and the formal structure is the, the local agency needs to ask the next bigger agency, ask the next bigger agency. So that is very well established. But the second piece of your question is about recognition. And of course, there's not enough recognition for what's happening on, on sort of the micro and community level. And I think, you know, amplifying um, best practices, amplifying innovative ideas, like there's a real opportunity um, for the grassroots organizations to come together and, and form a network and share those kinds of things. Because, you know, my experiences uh, and what worked in our community uh, maybe wouldn't have worked in the North Bay, but maybe it would work somewhere in, in Paradise or something. So it's like we're all we're all in this together, and I think there is an opportunity for us to sort of more formally get together as grassroots uh, disaster recovery organizers. So I agree. I think that, um, you know, when we, quite frankly, we didn't know if what we were doing would work. That's just straight up. I didn't know. I'd never been to this before. Like, we knew the advocacy piece would work. But as far as the structure of an organization like Rebuild North Bay Foundation, I don't know. I didn't have anybody to call to ask because there wasn't anything exactly like it. That's why, like, when I went up to Paradise and um, sat with the mayor and the town, town uh, manager and then Charles Brooks, I said, I don't know. This is what we did, and we'll help you, but we don't expect. This is not prescriptive. Like, this is adaptive. And, and if you go into it with the respect and the care and humanity at the core of everything you do, then you're going to be able to hear it. And look, we have been a target for uh, you know false stories about who we might be or whatever, shadow or dark. We're, we're, there's nothing dark money about us whatsoever. Uh, but the suspicion, I think, is what gets in the way the most. Is that they're like, how could you possibly just want to do this for a long time? And why aren't there more selfies involved? Do you know, why aren't you, why, because, and because we're not that sexy. This organization just isn't that sexy and it's long term. And, um, and for most of the time, I'm like, I expect the suspicion and I sort of uh, enjoy it because I know I'm going to prove them wrong. And that's always, um, that's okay. Now, a couple of times it's gotten a little more serious and I've been a lot less immune. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, excellent. Anyway, so. Do we need more recognition? I mean, yeah, I would love that. That would be great. But mostly what I want to see is I want to see tiny communities with few resources be looped into this network of care that says, we got you. We know this is tough and we're going to give you 15 people you can pick up the phone over the next five years. You know what they're going to do? They're going to answer your call and they're going to connect you with what you need because there is no real equity in disaster. And that goes from disabled rights to you're a small town with few resources and cannot hire Ernst & Young to navigate your FEMA. It's tough. Well, thank you for that. And, and uh, uh, points well taken. Uh, my hope is that this panel session today can help bring us all more visibility to those city leaders that are out there watching, that these resources are available. They're at your fingertips. Reach out to your nonprofits locally, to your NGOs. We're here to help. We don't need bundles and bundles of money. We have enthusiasm. Uh, we have expertise. Um, we're ready to answer the call. So thank you for your contribution. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks so much, Stephen. Thanks, Ellie. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.